been doing a series called New Creation Realities. Today's session is on our inheritance in Christ. Our inheritance in Christ. So let's turn and read our scripture, shall we? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. In other words, he received us, adopted us again to the lively hope living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Everyone say amen. amen. And look, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible. So you got an inheritance that's in heaven in the spirit that's incorruptible and undefiled. And that does not fade away. Everyone say yay. yay. Okay. Reserved in the heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. Is that our last scripture? Amen. And so we're going to learn today about your inheritance. Now, my father was a good man. He was an organized man. He was a businessman. He wasn't perfect. But when he got ready to pass away, he had all of his pages in order. He has his will, all the thing in order. And when, when he went, the will read out that we were left an inheritance. And I'm not going to go into any great ad identification or how much. But with that inheritance, we were able to purchase some of the property or Linda's inheritance. So that's physical inheritance. But let me explain to you. You know this. Jesus Christ came to where you and I were in our sin factor. Without sin. He came as a human being and he walked for 33 years, three, 33 and a half years. Then he received our, our penalties, fulfilled the law, died and rose again, amen, and now sits at the right hand of the Father, correct? Amen. Okay, what is he? Well, he purchased us, he cleansed us, he restored us, he died he rose again, fulfilled all the law that was against us. He now rose up, led captivity captive, sits at the right hand, and now is he, he is our advocate and lawyer to see that we get our inheritance. Hello. So Jesus is sitting up there going, go, Seth, go. I want you to move this way. Pay attention to me, son. You know, I'm, I'm hamming it up. Right there, I want you to see this is an inheritance that I have for you before the foundation of the world. So we have to be led by God. We have to pay, pay attention to God as he guides us through life so that we can obtain all the fullness of our inheritance. By the way, which fades not away. So it's there. It's locked right there for you. Everyone say, I have an inheritance. And Satan can't have it. What do we call him in the Bible? He's a thief, isn't he? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if he's a thief, you must have something that he wants. One is your inheritance. Because he's going to inherit the lake of fire. Scott and I and BG and a few of us, Sherry, we're all going to be there with a barbecue sauce. And when he, God shoves them off in the lake of fire, we're going to kick an old barbecue sauce and say, enjoy it down there, turkey. <laughs> but you think about it. What did God send his son to do to set us up in life? To rise from the dead, to set everybody free. Now we can leave this planet in Christ. And he's now at the right hand of the Father making intercession and making advocacy for us. He's our umpire. So he looks down and he says, Father, behold my children. And the Father says, How, are they your children? And he says, yes, behold them. And then the Father says, I adopt them as my own. And it says that we are all accepted in the beloved, in Christ. So the father accepts us as his own children again. You see, we were lost, but now we are. Yeah, we were in darkness, but now we're walk in the light. light. Amen. So welcome, everybody. We're going to get into this lesson. And as we do, 
I want you to really, if you can, take some notes. With Christ, we are given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you agree with that? We're given an inheritance which never goes away. Now it becomes a wonderful adventure for you and I to get up every morning, finding out what is ours in Christ. Taking the time to be with God and talking with God. It's kind of like having your own physical friend. I don't know about you, but I like to have friends. But in friendship, you've got you to have face-to-face -face time. What do you mean? You have to be able to talk to each other. Amen. And communicate and hear and talk and hear and talk. So when you see that I send out messages and I say, get in the face to face time. Imagine God sitting in a chair right across from you and you're talking to him face to face. And you'll find out there are scriptures laced all through the, all through the word. It talks about meeting with God, looking at his face, focusing on Jesus' face. We with an open face, let me quote you one. As beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image from glory to glory. That's 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Yeah, good. I want you to do it. Amen, somebody. All right. <laughs> amen. Okay. Now, you and I have to learn to deposit our time to God. We have to give our time to God so he can change us. No giving time to God. He's not going to tap you on the shoulder and interrupt you and say, hey, we haven't had our session today. No, have your session every day and ask God to change you. Some of us, we need to die out. Now, if it doesn't, now what I preach, if it doesn't fit your, your feet, don't put the shoe on. So if I say we, some of us, we need to do this and it doesn't fit you, please don't receive something that doesn't fit you preaching all talks to everybody so listen if you find yourself not happy nothing is coming your way you might be in the flesh and the bible says you need to die every day say lord kill my flesh and let it die out so that my soul and my spirit come alive okay the bible tells us if you got Light, don't hide it under a bushel or under a bed, but put it on a lampstand so everybody that comes into your life can see that you're lit up for Jesus. But what do we do? Now, I'm preaching at somebody, and I don't want to preach at anybody. Don't cover God in your life up with your unhappiness of your flesh. Make a note of that. You are supposed to die out so that you don't hinder yourself. Say amen. Read Romans 7. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. So with my mind, I serve the law of life. But with my flesh, I serve the law of death. Oh wretched man. So we know we die out to our flesh and we do it voluntarily. Say amen. All right, now I don't want to stop there because I'm going to move on to our inheritance. All right, would you take your Bible and open up in Romans chapter 8? We're going to look at two verses, 31 and 32. We have in Christ all things good. Do you believe that? We have in Christ all things good. If you have God in you, is he good? What he does, is it good? Not only that, but you could even say it's perfect. So the God in you is perfect. So you can tell what one you're walking in by how much success you have throughout the day. If you're walking in God, everything is going to come in line. Not, not total everything, but it'll start coming in line. Why? Because every knee shall bow to God in you. You have God in you. Hello. Okay. But your flesh won't bow to God unless you say, flesh, you need to die out. John the Baptist said, I must die out. So Christ must increase. There's a little word for us. So we need to ask God to slowly begin to cancel out our physical person and put in a spiritual mind instead. Can you say amen? So that we think spiritual things and we think good of people. Amen. 
You know, there are some Christians, I can't believe it, some Christians are so bound up, all they can see is the faults of others. And I think it's because of maybe self-justification. Oh, Seth's got faults, so I can have faults too. <laughs> no, your dad thinks you're perfect, and we know so. It's good. You're a good man. All right. Okay, here's some. You got Romans 8. I love you guys. You're a blessing. What shall we say to these things? How many know that if God be for us, who can be? What shall we say to these things? All the trials of life. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now listen. He who did not spare his own son, that's our heavenly father, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with Christ also freely give us what? All things. Everyone say, I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's my inheritance. So does God want you happy? That's your inheritance. Don't let the thief take it from you. Does God want you well? That's your inheritance. Don't let the thief take it from you. You're not going to die old and die of cancer because you're getting old. Come on. Stop thinking that way. There's one scenario that says death, doom. You never know what God's going to do. And there's one scenario that says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And he that's in you can overcome everything if you let him have control of your life. And the folks, the Christians that are failing are not letting God control their life. They're simply in control and they make a lot of mistakes. We all do. So I surrender daily. Say, God, it's a, uh, I can help you out. And God says, how can you help me out? Carrie says, by me dying to myself and getting out of the way. He says, thank you very much. Or let's move on. Okay, how can, he says, he freely gives us all things with his son. So do you have his son in your heart? Yes. Amen. So here's the four things we're going to cover. Number one, God in us. We need to learn what it means to be indwelt by God. Two, allowing the Holy Spirit to open our eyes about our inheritance. That's number two. We're going to cover number three, walking gracefully. You know, there's a lot of klutzes in the body of Christ. Gracefully. Don't be in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. He's always prepared. And if you're prepared, you're never in a hurry. You're always on time. And that's all I'm going to say there. We're just not going to go into this. So walking gracefully in the spirit gives us access to our inheritance. You can't be a clumsy, fleshly oaf and get anything from God. So what do you do? You die out to yourself. It's like the person that says, I can't take communion because I had a bad morning. How long does it take you to get cleansed from your sin? Momentarily. So why can't you take communion? Because you're listening to your flesh telling you you're so unworthy. Stop that. <laughs> your flesh is going to tell you everything. You're ugly. You're too big. You're too small. Nobody's going to like you. Ba, 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 ba. You know, your flesh has a voice. It's called feelings. <laughs> Nothing more than you hurt my feelings. <laughs> so if you remember a couple of weeks, I, I, I share this. I love kind of sharing this because these are the things that we hear when we're on our own. Oh, I don't need to go there that God can help you with. How many here know that your five physical senses can give you false feelings? Have you ever thought somebody was mad at you and, you, and they weren't? You just kind of read things wrong? Well, you see, let me, just, let me just tell you, don't read into things. That's where Satan likes to lie. Don't read into things. If I'm not my sorts, don't read in, oh, what's wrong with Pastor Kerry? And the devil go, here, let me give you a list. <laughs> Nobody laughed. So, watch the negatives. Watch dwelling negatively. Your body, again, has a voice. So don't let it override the voice of God in your heart. Say amen. 
Amen. In fact, I should be able to call you every name in the book and you should smile at me and say, I know you're just kidding, Pastor. But see, people who are really focused on themselves get offended so easily. That's a setup. We know that's a setup. So what do I do, Pastor? You die every morning to yourself. You say, Lord, I want you to kill my old man that's so crabby, nasty, my old woman that's so this and so that. Just begin to work on me, God, and then begin to worship him. He'll reach right on down and start removing some of that stuff. But if you never ask, you won't ever receive. And here's what the devil tells you. Oh, you're too unworthy to ask God to do that. No. No. Every human being is worthy of salvation. Everyone. And the angels are sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. So the last one we're going to cover is the key is abiding and walking in Christ. No other way. Say amen. So four things, God in us, indwelt by God, allowing the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see what we have and to teach us. Three, walking gracefully instead of a clumsy klutz. Hello? I did one called Don't Be a Klutz in God's Everlasting Kingdom years ago. And I talked about how easy it is for us to perform our walk with God. We come into church and we put in our Christianese. How you doing, brother? Hallelujah. Doing good. You know, you just screamed at your wife and kicked your, your dog. And you're doing good. So just be real. Say amen. Ask God to kill the thing that's in the way. And let's get on with God. How many here is receiving blessings? How many here want them to stop? Okay. Then pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. First point, God in us. Be more aware of God in you than God somewhere out there. Say amen. Because if we relate to God just being out there, and he is, he's distant. But if you relate, because you surrendered and asked Jesus to come into your heart, relate to him being in you. He's looking through your peepers. So don't put him on anything you shouldn't. <laughs> I always used to say that. He's looking out through you. And what does he see? He sees your big old lip hanging down and you're nodded off, not paying attention. Hello? No, you're a surrendered man and woman of God. Say amen. <laughs> so let's find out the importance. Go with me to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Most of you know this one. It talks about God standing at the door and knocking on your heart. Okay, so let me read it to you. This is verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door to your heart, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In other words, I, my father, the whole group's going to come in and dwell in you. Say amen. So when you get up in the morning, you need to rehearse that, that God is dwelling in you too. It will help settle you down. Oh, God's in me. He hasn't left me today, Sherry. <laughs> Amen. He's in you. He never will leave you. I've heard Christians say, oh, God has left me. He doesn't love me anymore. Shows you you never study. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I won't even disappoint you. All your disappointment is you. So let's deal with that, son, daughter. Amen. Everyone say, oh my. Go with me, Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Now I got the hiccups. All right, so let's look at this. The mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, the Old Testament, but now has been revealed to his saints. What is it? What is it? To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory, listen, of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who do you have in you? And God said, if you lift my son up, I will draw all men nigh unto him. 
So you want to have a lot of friends? Lift Jesus up. Stop blessing others with you. <laughs> I was really having a bad month years and years ago. I wasn't very old in the Lord, and I was preaching already. And a guy came up to me, and I, I made the mistake of asking him, how'd you like it? And he says, I don't. You don't like the sermon? He says, no, and I don't even like you. I really made my day. And I said, and then you know the story. Well, this is a different one. And I said, oh, yeah, what's the problem? He says, there's too much of you, not enough Jesus. Think about that. Too much of us, not enough Jesus. Now, I'm not preaching at you. This guy was saying it to me. I said, how do you mean? He says, try to get the word I out of your conversation. Me, I, what I'm doing, what we're doing. That's not necessarily wrong, but if too much of it is, you can see who's on the mind. And, and the guy became my really good friend. I don't know if Scott remembers Ed Trichler. Do you remember Ed Trichler? Yeah. He was, he was like my right arm buddy for the longest time. And, and he was always there to remind me, hey, that's not faith, Carrie. Let's get into faith, you know. But uh, he told me, he says, there's too much of you trying to perform trying to dazzle people with your personality. No, 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 no. Preach Christ. Christ will win them all. I thank God for him. Now, I'm sure he's with the Lord by now because he was old when I met him. <laughs> then he moved down to Texas, got remarried. Gosh, he must have been 90, you know, loving God, you know, spry, could swim laps in a pool. You know, I don't swim laps anymore. I just do circles. All right. So listen to what <laughs> listen what it says. God wants us to know the mystery of his will that was hidden in the beginning. What creature does it say? I have to put it right. What creature in the world God doesn't want to know all of his plans? The devil, right? Yeah. It says, and the scripture says, add the princes of this world had known what Jesus came to do, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So Satan can't read your mind. He can't read what you're doing. That's why we go to God, get our marching instructions. We do all those things and we walk with God the best we can. And anytime we fall short, God makes up the edge, makes up the difference. But God is not going to let what he says to you as an individual be known to the enemy. So let me say this to you. The reason why we shouldn't dwell in our past, and, and, and this is true, is because we had a lot of mistakes in our past. Pick out all the good memories and throw away the bad. Say amen. Okay. In the present, the reason why the present's not so good, because there's sin in the present. There's evil in the present, isn't there? We, we get up in the morning and there's trials out there. The enemy's doing things. You're hearing about wars, rumors, all the... So in the presence that we live, the enemy's working in the present. But there's one place, actually there's two places you can go where Satan cannot go. Do you remember what they are? You guys should have this memorized. Number one, Satan can't follow you into your prayer closet. He doesn't go in and listen to what you pray. Since you say, Father, in Jesus' name, he's thrown out. Now, wasn't Satan thrown out of heaven? Okay. And, did, and then he got back in there through Adam's authority. But then Jesus came and threw him out again, didn't he? So, not only can Satan not come into, your, into the spirit, into your prayer closet. But he can't come with you into your future. He doesn't know what your future holds. This is another reason why I'm trying to encourage you to be with God. Because your God holds your future. And he'll show you what it is. And he'll hide it from Satan. And that's why it's so important for us to make God our friend. You see, because when I become friends with somebody, they share their secrets with you. Because they know your friendship is loyal. 
do you think God's any different? He's far more official in that area. Let God become your friend. Stop thinking of your own worthiness. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who died and gave himself for me. So we live in the package of our inheritance. Say amen. Amen. And you're learning how to get your hands on the fullness thereof, which fades not away. So you got a lot of time to find out what it is. Guarantee there are going to be some. They won't find out anything till they get to heaven. They won't make it. Then God will have to teach them. So while they're in school, you and I will be playing and having fun with God. Because what you don't learn down here, you'll learn there. Because God needs you to be complete. Say amen. Think about that as we go on. Are you indwelt by God? Yeah. Okay. Point one. As Christians, we must learn to trust God on the inside of us. Say amen. He is the one who should be navigating our life. Number two, we must learn to become spiritually minded and not leaning on our own natural thinking, understanding. Number three, that is why we are to daily allow God to lead us and enjoy what he shows us. I mean, I, find, I run into Christians that can't even enjoy God. Come on now. Are you greater than God? How come your misery outweighs his love? Moving right along. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10. Listen to this. This is what God declares about you. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For in who? Him. Who's in him? Who's in you? So, and who's Jesus? He's the fullness of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in a body form. That's what that means. So, if you're in Christ... You have all the fullness of God at your disposal. Boy, I think we need to be more creative. Think about some of that. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been sent to teach us the spiritual workings of the kingdom. But we have to spend the time with God so we're not repulsive. Folks, the Spirit resists the what? And gives grace to the? So when we meet with God, that's a way in which we humble ourselves that the Holy Spirit can speak with us and approach us and teach us. Why? Because our flesh isn't repelling him. Every bit of your pride, every bit of the things that repel God is all in the flesh. That's why we're to crucify it daily. Once you do that, your soul and your spirit's not going to get in the way. It's going to be able to learn, able to grow. Say amen. But if we don't do what we're supposed to do, we're going to be a rock. And it's not going to be Christ. And rocks sink. You can't guide a rock. Hello? You can't throw a rock very far. It has its own properties. But we follow and stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. Say amen. So Colossians 9 says, For in him is the fullness of Godhead belly. Look at verse 10. And you are what? Complete. You are complete in him. Where are we? We're in him. He's in us. So while we're doing that, we are what? Complete. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. Complete. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Surely you brought nothing into the earth and you're not going to carry anything out. So godliness with contentment gives you completeness. You see, if I'm sitting around going, I don't have this and I don't have that and I got to have this and I got to have that. Am I complete? Am I, am I at rest? No, I'm not. I'm in the flesh. 
But the Bible says when we're in him and he in us, we are completed. Has God ever known any defeat? Has anybody been able to get any tricks over on God? Let him lead your life then and you'll become the same. Everybody said, well, John, John the Beloved, he wrote the book of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the book of Revelation. Wow, John had this testimony that he was going to get as close to Jesus as he possibly could. He would say to Peter, Sherry, I got shotgun. Nobody's getting close to Jesus. You always see him laying, even in the communion, laying on Jesus' breast, just buddy-buddy with Jesus. And he was the only disciple that lived his life out. Nobody could do anything to him. I wonder if the closer you and I learn to get to God, the more protected, the more favored, the more blessed we become. Anybody here with that thought of mind? Do you believe that? Raise your hands and wave them around. I believe that, Lord. I believe that, Lord. See, the show of faith, faith brings substance of things not seen. So by confessing that and lifting your hand, you're showing God faith in what you believe. So don't be one of those squatters when God says, oh, everybody lift your hands. Big old rock. Let's put you in a slingshot and fling you around somewhere. No, don't be a rock. Be a lovely child that is excited over your life in Christ. Say amen. All right. Let's go to point two. Point two already? All right. Yeah, point two. Point two, allowing the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to teach us. Can you do that? Say amen. Go with me to John 16. And while you're going to John 16, I want to read something to you. John 16, verse 13 is where you're going to go. But this is Romans 8, 14 through 17. Let me read it. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the adult sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption that the Father, by whom we may cry out, Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. Or my father, father, my loving father. Okay? I watch people walk around. They're always trying to impress everybody. Oh, I praise the Lord in the name of Yahweh. He's my Abba, father. And they're just doing all that. Yeah, I wonder how Abba, father he is to you. We can't get you to church and you're doing your own thing all the time. And then you're yelling, Abba, father. You know, the words of our mouth and the actions that we do should really kind of line up, say amen. Don't say you're going to do a whole bunch of things and not be willing to do any of that. You know, that's called a hypocrite. And we don't want any of that. Listen to the rest of this, okay? We cry out, Abba, Father. Now listen, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that's inside of us, that we are the children of God. Someone say amen. And if children, then what? Heirs. You have an inheritance in Christ. And heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Guess what that says? That says that everything Jesus got, you get by faith. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus got, sits at the right hand, all the victories, everything. He gave it to you and it's all your inheritance. Now, the thief doesn't want you to know that. He wants to take it from you. He wants you to be miserable all your life because you take a miserable person, put him in a church, and say, this is what Christianity is. Nobody will want to be saved. So don't practice so hard being miserable. Die to yourself and live for God. Say amen. Make a face at me. It's okay. Nobody follows a hearse. They follow fire trucks, noise and excitement. The only thing a, a frown and walking around like that does, if people want to bury you early. <laughs> I'm joking. It's hard because what is pride? 
it's the thinking with self, isn't it? It's the feeding of self. Now, please, I'm, I'm be gentle here. There are two kinds of prize, pride, and one is terribly dangerous. The first pride, we see it. The guys buffing up and the women buffing up in the, in the gyms. Huh, huh, huh. They look like a million bucks, but they haven't got any personality like a flea. You know, <laughs> you know it just seems there's no balance anywhere. So the guys get all buffed out and they walk around. They have no personality. It's all about them. So that's one form of pride. We call that what? Arrogance. Another name for it. The other form of pride is the most dangerous and people don't really pay attention. I've been preaching this for nearly 30 years. When a person suffers with depression, when a person suffers with depression, who are they thinking of? See how Satan laced that? It's really tough when somebody's depressed and they can't get themselves off their mind. It's still a form of pride. And the spirit resists the... You see how dangerous that is. So you get somebody who is feeling sorry all the time for themselves and always putting themselves down. You got, they need to be rescued. Because all they will do is sink. They'll get a little back up and they'll keep sinking. And they'll go back up, sinking. Going around that mountain one more time. Yes, we're going around that mountain one more time. I've dealt with literally 30, 40 people suffer with manic depression and stuff like that. If they don't stay on their medicines and they don't stay with God, it's hard to wrestle what's going on in their head. Satan saw to that. That's part of the curse of Adam. So we pray for them and we help them and we as best we can. But you don't tell a person that suffers with a prideful thing. You don't, tell, you don't pamper them. So people that suffer with that, I have to really, really, really seek God. Because you don't lecture them. They're usually really more smarter than they need to be. And they set themselves up. I call it painting themselves in a corner. Do, finally gets to the point you can't say anything because you're wrong and they're right we want to pray for people that they don't suffer that depression is a terrible thing if we we don't get a handle on it with God someone say amen, amen. now my my heart goes out because I've known a lot of them I knew a young fellow what a wonderful man he was very talented he played the cello he was so talented that he Seattle Symphony played in Seattle Symphony He's this kid. His parents bought him like a $20,000 cello, the, some kind of really valuable one, all refurbished and everything. He got depressed, and he took it, went right up into my driveway and smashed that thing on my driveway, saying, God doesn't love me anymore. Then goes out, gets in his car, new car that his folks bought for him, and wrecks it on purpose. It's a dangerous thing for you to be self-centered and depressed. You need to die and get rid of that. And that's why people, what we take for granted a lot in our thinking, because we can separate good from bad a lot of that. Some of these people can't. They think everything that comes in their heads of God. No, God speaks in your heart, deep in your core, not your head. Okay. And so they wrestle with that. So please keep those people in your prayers because we love them and care for them. But it's really hard to deal with somebody who's got me on their mind. It's really hard. So we have to pray. We pray for our brothers and sisters. Say amen. All right. Allowing the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and teach us. John 16, please. <clears throat> Verse 13 says, however... When he, the spirit of truth, that's talking about the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will guide us into what? Now, you have to pay attention and be humble for him to do that. He's willing to show you everything God has for you. But you've got to be patient to sit and let him give you that tour. And you can't be into yourself because he won't talk with you. He's like a dove. Doves have to be welcomed. And embraced. And they'll befriend you. The Holy Spirit's very sensitive. And he doesn't like the flesh of humans. 
So that's why Satan has hid the fact. A lot of hiding the fact is, let us become religious, but don't deal with dying to yourself. And the first sermons that Jesus pre preached was for them to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. But see, what we get as Christianity is, God's good. Praise the Lord. Give your heart to God, and then you still got all that flesh you have to deal with. And it's hard. And if you go to the wrong kind of church, it's never dealt with, and you grow up as being a baby for 45 years of being your Christianity. People get irritated and frustrated because you're not proceeding forward in the things of God. Some would say, oh, me. All right, so it says, however, with the spirit of truth that come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak in his own authority. I'm the Holy Spirit. No, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak and he will tell you things to what? Folks, here's where the problem lies. So many people are seeking out for prophets who want to know what the future holds. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let God reveal things to you. That's the better way to do it. And then if you run into somebody that's bringing prophetic things and it bears witness to what you already know, good. Now, I believe there are some really good prophets out there. And they're operating because the church hasn't been operating in its, capa capa its capacity. But so God raises up prophets to speak until the church catches up. But the problem is we don't run around looking for a word. We go to God and his scripture for our word. Say amen. That's a more sure prophecy. Then we line everything that's said. One of my favorites is, uh, I forget his name, but he's got a wonderful ministry. You know, um, Everything that they say has to line up with the word of God. If it doesn't, throw it out. Just make sure you don't toss the baby out with the bathwater. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so the Holy Spirit's job is to take you and to show you your future. And he can do it without no devil. Now, how did people like Jeremiah see the future? People like Isaiah. People like Joel. Got up, caught up with God. They just got caught up with God. God didn't say one day, boop, you're going to have a vision. Ding. No, they were just being caught up in God and talking with God and God reveals to them. How's it going to happen to you? You're going to have to get caught up with God, be with God, and he'll reveal your future to you. And he'll do it a little bit at a time. Hello. Now, when I, in my ministry, when I was, I was very young. Gosh, at 24, I already had a church over 200 people. 24 years old. Didn't know anything. Very green under the ears. But I had a good backing. I had my family backing me and other elders backing me. And the church grew and grew and grew and grew. And I, the only thing is, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have no time for study, no time for anything. You want your pastor to be able to study so you get good stuff on Sunday morning. Say amen. And you want him to be able to pray so he stays nice and healthy and happy. You don't want a crabby pastor. Say amen. And God says, I will give you our shepherds after my own heart that will feed you with knowledge and wisdom. Amen. And I hope that God puts me in that category. Amen. In Jesus name. So God wants to teach you. Can you sit with God long enough for him to show you your future? Back when I was training for the ministry, one of the things our pastor would do is says, now that some of you don't have jobs, you're not really working nine to five or anything, you should be, spend quality time, maybe an hour or two with God, see how that works out for you. And I'm thinking, all that time? What is... God not understand what I'm talking about? He needs two hours of my time? And my pastor would look at me and he says, son, the two hours for you to spend with God is not for you to pray to God. It's for you to get out of the way so God can use you more. And I, then he began to teach me about being saturated with presence, letting him open the eyes of our understanding, he has to do all that. And we have to sit with the doc long enough for him to do that. Can you say, can you say amen? 
Doc, how long is this appointment going to last? Half an hour? Two days. <laughs> Amen. So always be, whatever God, always be in this attitude. Whatever God wants, I want to be able to do it. Now, practically, you might not be able to do that. And so, so stop thinking how you can't. Start thinking how you can. Miracles don't come in cans. They come in cans. Go to the store and get a couple of miracles. You can do all things. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. A couple of points I want to bring out. Number one, the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth. All truth that is about God. Who we are in Christ and what our inheritance is. Everyone say amen. Remember the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. Why? Because we have something he wants. Why did Satan go into the garden during Adam and Eve's time? Because they had something he wants. He's a thief. What did they have? Their birthright. Satan lost his planet when he tried to take it before. God threw him out of heaven. He was already the devil when it comes into Adam and Eve. Now he wants to take their inheritance from them. And we know what happened reading all through that. Jesus finally came and redeems man. Now you and I are born again children of God. He is still a thief and he wants to steal from you what he can. So you're smart, you meet with God, you keep yourself under God's protection all day long, and guess what? He's got to go somewhere else. He's got to find some susceptible individual who hasn't done their homework. And then he'll light on them, and he'll make their week bad. The real story about Satan coming to tempt man, you can find it in the book of Job. Satan could do everything that Job was fearfully about. God did not give the devil permission to get Job. Job did. But he still couldn't take Job's life, could he? Listen, Satan can tempt you all that he wants. He cannot get one over you that you don't let him get. He's a trickster, he's a liar. The people of the world in Samaria called him Noki, the trickster. He's the poltergeist, the stirrer of trouble. He's the one that Paul talks about, the buffeting spirit that buffeted him. All his life kept harassing him. Maybe you have one that you need to bind up. Spirits follow lineages of families, you know. Alcoholism was a problem in my family. Because we came from Scotland. Everybody drinks in Scotland. <laughs> I mean, they drink till they can't see straight. I mean, if you don't believe me, go and visit. It's a celebration time. I don't know. But some of those spirits probably followed my family all the way into the United States. They're called a familiar spirit. This is what the Old Testament says. It says the curse of the fathers will be rehearsed under the children to so many generations. That's what that is. That's an evil spirit that follows those generations. Now, folks, did you get saved? Say amen real loud. Yes. So you're redeemed from the curse, right? That means that the devil has been cut. When you said, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin, that familiar spirit has been cut from your life. Now, you can invite it back, but no. So you are the first of the generation that surrendered to God, and you've cut the curse. How about your children? What are you going to teach them? You're going to teach them to live for God and live above? Gosh, you can't even get him to church. <laughs> I know, I teased. I, I have a son, I'm going to tell you. And I dedicated my son to the Lord. He got saved when he was five, came up to the altar, got spirit filled. And right now he's doing his own thing. And, and I go to God and I said to God, Lord, I want my son to be serving you and loving you. You know, now this is on tape. 
and I hope that maybe somebody will play this for him because I love him dearly. He became a close friend, but I made a mistake. I, I don't mind confessing my fault. I tried to become my son's friend. Doesn't work. I have to be his father. <laughs> so when you try to become your children's friend, it doesn't work because the authority thing then is removed. And you know something about friendships? Don't worry, I'm going to finish the sermon. Friendships, we have this fallen nature about friendships. If I can become your friend, if I'm a fallen person and not a Christian, I can then take advantage of you because I know all your faults and all your problems. So when you ask me to change, I'm going to say, don't you dare ask me. You see the friendship, how it can get in the way if it's not built on Christ. So I made the mistake of uh, uh, befriending my son and drinking beer with him and, and other things. And finally, God spoke to me. He says, son, uh, your son doesn't need his dad to be his friend. And like one of his junkies or buddies, he needs his dad to be his dad. You know, and at that time, I'm going through everything, sickness, all that, lost everything. Okay, so I'm not trying to justify it, but let me encourage you. Don't try to be a friend. Be who God designed you to be. And so when I became the father again, he began to respect me again. Do you understand? All right. That was for somebody. Somehow God had me go in that, that line. So be careful. Don't try to perform for somebody to win them. That's compromise. Instead, be who you are, be very loving, very caring, but be firm so they know where you stand. Say amen. All right, so the third thing is the Holy Spirit teaches only the humble. So you got to be asking God, Lord, Lord, I choose to be humble. I choose to be humble, non-offensive to you so you can teach me my inheritance. Everyone say Amen. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 12 says, But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the person that's in that man, the spirit of man. Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. Now, when you and I accepted Jesus Christ, there was a marriage. God come into our heart and he wants to share his plan with us. And then it goes on further to say, and God, except by the spirit of God, it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. Say the Holy Spirit's job is to teach me all things that pertain to life and godliness. But where's your attention? Sometimes our attention is caught up on everything else but where it really needs to be. Does God need us to keep changing? Why? Haven't we arrived? Aren't you old enough now that you can't, you're an old dog, you can't learn new things? Or you don't want to? No. We have eternity. I'm looking forward to seeing some of that creation out there. There's a universe that looks like a big eye. I mean, there's all kinds of great stuff. I look forward to that. Because if you just look at the plane of humanity, just as the earth in the physical sense, you're going to get depressed. Unless you're on a vacation and look at waterfalls and maybe in Hawaii or somewhere down in Cancun or somewhere. I mean, you're enjoying all the, the good things. But... Oftentimes, we're so focused on our surroundings, it steals our joy. Let's move on to our next point. Walking gracefully. Everyone say walking gracefully. In the spirit gives us access. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. 2 Peter chapter 1. While you're going to... Um, chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 2 through 4. I'm going to read another part of that chapter, okay? This is in, you might write this down, 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, 
For if you do these things, which we're going to list here in a minute, you will never stumble. I don't know about you, but I do not like to fall. You know how it takes to get me up with one leg? So, and why do they always at the doctor's office says, one of the questions they asked you, Denise, have you fallen? No, do you want me to? Here, let me show you how it is. <laughs> Amen. Isn't it strange? You, you injure your finger and you got a big old band-aid on it like that, right? And I, you guys did great because somebody's going to laugh when I mention this. Got a big old band-aid on your finger. You don't see anybody. You're the first at church. And then a couple people show up and the first thing they say to you is, what happened to your finger? And then another couple of people come in and they look at your finger. What happened to your finger? That's why when people have operations and everything, they stay home. Because they don't want to have that happen. <laughs> what happened? Don't you pay attention? <laughs> Amen. All right. Walking gracefully. So in 2 Peter, this is the one I told you to go. Verse 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Yay. In the knowledge of God. You want to be more graceful? Multiplied in the knowledge of God. And of the Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That through these you might be partakers of his divine nature. Hello? Amen. Okay. And then it says... By which you have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you might part be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the world or the corruption that's in the world through love. Folks, your spirit's never going to want to sin because it's got God in it. Your head might want to go off the deep end sometimes. But your flesh is always the thing that always says it's not satisfied. You slept eight hours and it says, give me another nine. Hello. Amen. You got out to eat and boy, the food looks good. It smells good. And so you eat not one plate, but eat two. You see, so our flesh is never satisfied. It always wants more. Always wants more. The Bible says self-control is one of the fruits of God's spirit. Being able to control yourself. So that's something that God does on the inside of you if you let him have control. You can't always control yourself. Get somebody to make you angry. And you're so angry you're white. How well can you control yourself? So we don't want to get that far. Could you say amen? So we let God run our life. Which causes us not to be pulled into those destructive scenarios say amen. amen so grace and peace are multiplied through the knowledge of him and it says now that through these promises you might be partakers of his divine nature point one the more we know about God the more graceful and blessed we become so that's why the enemy wants us to stay ignorant and religious two we have been given all things to pertain to life and godliness. How many things? Then you need to spend time discovering what that is. And that is, requires you and God together. You're not just going to read about it in the word. You know, a lot of times you read in the word, you didn't get anything out of it. Until you pray and ask God to show you. That's the key. The Holy Spirit has to show you. So it stays with you. Because if you read the parable of the sower, it says, those on the wayside, those hear the word, they receive it with gladness, but have no root in themselves. Satan comes right away to steal the word that's sown in their head. And they forget. No, in your heart. Holy Spirit has to put it in your heart. Not in your head. Your head gets it later. Your heart gets it now. Say amen. Boy, that should make some of you happy. You have a connection to God. No one else does. You're the only one like you. So take advantage of what Jesus did for you. Are you with me? Then it goes on. Walking gracefully. 
So it's with grace and peace be multiplied. So the second thing is we have been given all things. So let's take advantage of learning them. And thirdly, as new creatures in Christ, we've escaped the corruption that's in the world. The only thing that's happening to you is your flesh is getting older. But if you look at your countenance, if you're really with God and, and loving God, your countenance is getting younger. Some of you actually look younger than you did a year ago. Maybe we're not so beat up, you know. And, and it's the appearance of the presence of God. It's not the appearance of you, your makeup or such. It's the appearance of presence of God lingering and on you. Made them, makes us beautiful. Because it's God and not us. Amen. Put on a garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. I'm singing way out of key. <laughs> All right, so let's go on. Now we need to know that if we're led by the spirit of God and we slow down and let God guide us, as many as are led by the spirit, they are the adult sons of God. Folks, you can become an adult instantly once you're under the Holy Spirit. Once you have been, see, I've been in meetings where the Holy Spirit has completely taken me over. And that I was like watching myself just do what the Lord is having me do. I remember coming up Bonnie Lake Hill up into 214th where there wasn't any light at that time. There was a man laying on the street with about 40 or 50 people all around him. Some kind of accident. As I was coming up Eli Hill from Sumner up to Bonnie Lake. I couldn't tell you how I got to the top of the hill. I was in the spirit. And then when I came down, dipped down and came up to that place, there's all these people on the road. God says, pull over. I pulled over and it was like he put his hand on my back and pulled me out of the car. And I'm just going out of the car and I just know what to do. I just know what to do. I walked up to all the people. I said, excuse me, can you back up right now? And they all backed up and I put my hand on the man and I pray and I says, God, we need a miracle here. Save this man, heal him. And Lord God, don't let him die. In Jesus' name, he sits right up. God did that. Took over. How could God do that? Yield, to yield to him. To get out of the way, to stay that way as much as you can throughout the day. So God could use you at any particular time he needs to. Say Amen. And everybody just backed off. And they all looked at me like I was some kind of saint. It wasn't me at all. I says, take care of them. God bless you. And somebody says, who are you? I mean, just, it was like something out of the Bible. I says, I'm just one, another one of God's children. Got in my car and drove off. That's who you are. You're no longer the person you used to be. You've got to start seeing yourself that way. You're indwelt by God. You're the graceful hands and feet of God. Be that way. Say amen. Don't be in a hurry. Don't get all upset. God is never in a hurry. He's always on time. He moves things around. So don't you let circumstances get you to take from Peter, pay Paul, and get you stressed out. You're better than that. Say amen. amen. Final point is abiding and walking in Christ inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 and 12 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time that he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven which are on earth both those things in him verse 11 I got the hiccups now again sorry <clears throat> so in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the course and the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise and the glory of God. That's who you are. Say amen. amen. Say I have an inheritance. Have the only way I'm to know all of it. The only way I'm to know all of it is to sit with God and have him show me. Amen. You're not, folks, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get it all from the word. 
You won't be able to get it all from unless the Holy Spirit's showing you. That's why you get a lot of people who are not spirit-filled. They don't talk in tongues. They don't know how to move in the spirit. They don't get a whole lot. It's more religion, and it's more division. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So we need to have the letter of the word, and we need to have the life of God working together, causing us to be graceful. Say amen. And we have to learn to abide with God. So, you see, I'm a busy man, even though I'm not doing as much probably as you are. But you can be busy and still commune and fellowship with God throughout the day. You're busy, you got five appointments. Take God with you throughout the day in every appointment. Talk with him while you're driving to him. Why are you locking God out while you're busy? Encourage him to come. He'll, find, he'll really show you how to do a little better. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you years and years of being with him, how he can show you how to do it better, quicker, faster, and with greater rest than anyone. Spend time with your God. Say amen. So it says, listen, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated, predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his counsel. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 says that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You need to know your inheritance. Someone died and left you something. Then he rose again to see that you got it. Then sits at the heavenly father's right hand and intercedes that you continually be a success in the earth. Can you say Amen. Finally, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. Don't let the thief steal it. Colossians, and this is my last scripture, chapter 1, verse 12 through 14 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That he has delivered to us the, and delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Everyone say, I have an inheritance. I can't wait to see what it is. I love the fact that someone died and left me something. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. All right. Did you get something out of that this morning? Give the Lord a praise, will you? The Lord bless you.